So, hello officially and welcome to this online event brought to you by Matchboard in partnership with Incuba. The event is entitled From Journey Mapping to Journey Management, the Evolution of CX in Telco and Utilities, and will run for one hour. During this time, we hope to inspire you with some new ideas and approaches in your CX journey. We'll have two presentations followed by Q&A. So think of your questions as we go along and you can enter them in the chat room at any point so you don't forget them later. Uh, very important, we're giving away a copy of the new book, Lean CX, to the person who asked the most interesting question during Q&A as judged by our esteemed sponsor. I'm Sharon Melamed, as most of you know, Managing Director of Matchboard, and I'll shortly introduce our first speaker. But just some quick housekeeping. Um, firstly, we're recording, as you know. Secondly, if you have internet issues, there is a mobile um, number and passcode in the calendar invite. And finally, could I ask that you just uh, stay on mute until question time to prevent outside noise for the speakers. And now to our first speaker, Dr. Robert Duke. Robert is a customer experience innovation and competitive strategy expert, and he's the lead author of the book Lean CX. Robert has a PhD in cognitive psychology. He's advised organizations for over 20 years and lectured MBAs across Europe, Asia, and Australia. Over to you, Robert. Uh, th thank you for the very kind introduction, Sharon. I always feel like um, these things are a little bit like the whole getting food from McDonald's. Yeah? You pay first and then hope it's good afterwards. So hopefully I can live up to your expectations today about um, what this might be like. My plans to um, give you a little bit of background in why I think that journey management is probably the future of CX or the cutting edge of CX and why it's important. But I wanna do that from perhaps a way of thinking about customer experience that maybe some of you here haven't thought about before. So hopefully this will be a little bit um, a little bit different and a little bit more interesting for you than what I might have otherwise talked about as, a, as an academic and a strategy consultant. So does my screen come up, Sharon? Can you just give me a thumbs up if that's there? Great. I love this picture um, of the Starling memoration because I think it says something about the way that our markets actually operate. You can tell there's clearly a pattern here going on in this crowd of birds, but where they're gonna to go to next is not easily predictable. And it's that where we're going to next, that's the reason that I think makes uh, journey management more important than journey management when it comes to uh, journey mapping when it comes to CX. Because with this change that happens all the time, it's just about trying to work out what the next thing to do should be based on current data. You've all experienced changes in what your customers prefer and had to adapt to that. So today I want to talk to you about the experiences that we offer. And I probably got quite a shocking one to start with and I want to ask you a question. Can you imagine offering this experience to your, um, to your clients? Um, and I'm sure that there are some people here who think this is quite a wonderful um, outfit, but I can't even imagine asking a woman to consider wearing this. And even if you just neglect the whole of the outfit, even just the swimming cap on the top of her head, I would find challenging to, to ask her to do. For me, this looks like an experience that almost nobody wants, but there's a very large firm that spent a very large amount of money to offer this experience. And they did so thinking that they were making some good decisions for their, for their business about doing that. On the other hand, if you think about Decca Records, down the Beatles, that was an experience everybody wanted and somehow they, they missed it. And this, this um, is really interesting. I see that it is actually hard for people to talk about what it is that they want because most of us don't know. Have you ever been uh, out? I'm sorry, someone's got some interference. Have you ever been out um, having a really great time um, at a social event or an evening and part of you says, oh, I need to go home now because it's very late. And the other part of you says, no, but we're having such a great time. I want to stay just one more beer, right? That's what my, my evil inner brain says. It says that one thing. And in trying to work out what we want, often we don't actually know ourselves. 
And so I think that there's an approach to collecting data that you've got to take that maybe is a level up from the way that you're thinking about surveying customers and the voice of the customer that you're accessing right now. Um, it turns out we actually have three brains and the ph physiology of this I found fascinating. Our oldest brain is the, the primal bit. It hang handles anger. Um, it handles, you know, that fight or flight response, all of that stuff. It's our lizard brain. And to get you in touch with your lizard brain, I thought I might share this picture with you. Um, do you get a little bit of a flutter in your stomach when you think about sitting on this beam eating lunch, right? If you do, that's your lizard brain in action. Um, no one would, of course, do that right now. It's a quite remarkable picture. I find that I get that little, um, that lizard brain thing in my stomach happening, right? There's a second bit though on top of our lizard brain that means that we get to be social creatures and we like to call that our Labrador brain. And if to activate your Labrador brain, I've got this picture. Clearly this picture is not true. I don't know of a, a, a set of star constellations that magically form angel wings. But if you look at the moment that these two people are having, you can probably feel the romance that's trying to be communicated. And if you allow yourself um, to do so, um, maybe you won't, won't become a hopeless romantic, but perhaps a hopeful uh, romantic. Some of the experiences that I think that we'd like to provide customers maybe could do with being a little bit less uh, primal or a little bit less functional and instant gratification, which is what our lizard wants. And maybe they could be a little bit more, a little bit more human. On top of all of that, we've got this leader brain that does the rational bit. And uh, it does kind of things, I, I love this pic. When you look at these plants here, are you looking at just some random plants or are you looking at a woman's face? Can you recognize that it's both of them? Whatever it is that you decide is the answer, this is a woman's face or it's a set of plants, you'll experience that as truth and it's your leader brain that's doing that. Now, what I think is um, really challenging for us as CX professionals and particularly in the verticals that we work in is that actually all of those three brains together make our motivations incredibly complex and, and potentially conflicting. And I thought I would show you that when we look inside ourselves, this statue, I love this, um, this sculpture, but what's inside ourselves, there's a part of us that wants to be certain and another part that's focused on anything that's new. If you consume the new, if you consume news media, it's because you're interested in something new. And as you drive down the street, you might find yourself back when we're allowed to drive again, of course, um, reading out the signs as, as you go past them. Those two things, that's our lizard brain in action. Um, we also have this desire for love to be part of groups and connect to something bigger. And that connectedness is really important. Uh, on top of that, we have a need in those groups to have a level of prestige and to feel important and for our individuality to be recognized. And I know um, something relevant to some of you here in the telco space. I remember when the first capability in Australia to make a video call uh, came out and I got one of those A320 phones. It was a huge thing and it had a screen on it and the network was fast enough to be able to make video calls. And I was so excited about that because I had one of this cutting edge technology pieces of things. And I had thought it was gonna be like Dick Tracy. All right. calling all cars, calling all cars. I thought this video call was going to be amazing. And I got home and realized I had nobody to call. And it was really interesting watching the company that put out those that new technology, in millions of investment in the network, you know, billions of investment probably, got the supply arrangement with the new phone that could had the capacity to make the video calls across 3G. And they'd forgotten that I would have nobody to call. So they started to sell those phones in pairs with a plan. I thought that was really cool. Both of you buy one, so at least you've got somebody to call, right? Um, and that was kind of a pretty cool achievement and, uh, and maybe something that changed the world for the better or for the worse, I'm not sure. On top of our need for love and prestige and our desire to be interested in the unusual and to have certainty, um, we need to make sure that the world's becoming a better place and that we can achieve what we're trying to achieve. All of those things together are what we in CapFeather call our capful needs. And this is kind of like a modified version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The challenge is, as your customers interact with you across their journeys, you need to manage those journeys because sometimes a different need is coming to the foreground for that customer. And what we default to is trying to make things quick and easy and instant and simple and fast. We want to make them certain. But we give up our ability to nudge customers to better outcomes for us and for them if we don't think about some of their other needs. And to pierce this veil, I think deep insight's kind of important. And I want to talk to you about some examples of where I think, think some companies have managed to, to pierce, the, uh, pierce the veil. 
The most interesting thing is that moment that occurs on social media when you're about to send something. And I'm sure that all of you have had an experience in the world with an email where you thought, perhaps I should send that email tomorrow after I've slept on it. Maybe I'm a little bit cranky right now and it might not have the result that I'm hoping that it's going to have. Well, it turns out that every time you post on social media on Facebook or Instagram or uh, LinkedIn, what you're creating is a record for eternity, as far as I can tell, about some part of how you are feeling in that moment. And I think Snapchat did an amazing thing at realizing that at that moment, there was a different value that they could offer customers if they could give them a way to be able to make a post that doesn't haunt you forever. And that's the main difference with Snapchat. And my teenager, um, who's now um, 17, he got his license this week to drive a car. So I'm very excited about that. He doesn't use Facebook. He doesn't use LinkedIn. He uses Snapchat. And he really likes the fact that when he posts something, first of all, it's not a broadcast, it's a narrow cast. It just goes to who he wants to have a conversation with. And secondly, once they've consumed it, it evaporates. So it doesn't get held against him in the future if perhaps he's having a bad day or a bad moment. Now think about what data it takes to realize at the point of providing a social media platform that you need to be able to realize there's a different value that you could nudge people to want to buy into. And Snapchat's been incredibly successful with millennials for picking up on that piece of data and leveraging it. Another example that I want to give you has to do with um, Afterpay, who's won 3.5 million users in the credit market um, in Australia. Quite remarkable, the market for impulse buying has never been more oversupplied, especially since um, COVID's arrived. What I think is really interesting is um, Afterpay thought about the core value around usability and the core value around their brand. And what they did at the moment of purchase is realise there are a group of buyers that do not want to be locked onto some kind of interest mill, uh, interest treadmill, right? They're frightened about that maxing out their credit card and never getting rid of it. And collecting that data meant that they could build a whole piece of data, a whole business model around a different credit offer. Now, there's still an interest charge on this card, but it's paid for by the retailer who really at that moment wants to prompt a customer to make a purchase. And we know the research on this, right? We know that customers who purchase on credit tend to purchase high value items and services. They tend to pay for high margin value items and services, and they tend to make a decision more readily to buy those things. That's the whole purpose of being able to buy on impulse. I think what's quite remarkable though, as a retailer for, um, who might be in the Afterpay network is being able to realize that that actual offer was really cool. And there's a value up on being able to do buy now, pay it later. Now, if you have a look at what Afterpay's done, you realize, Great, we've got some other companies like Apple and Commonwealth Bank and PayPal are trying to get into that market now. My money's on Apple because I think that they've got more data about their customers and what matters to their customers from a feeling point of view. And I think it's leveraging that feeling data to enhance the value proposition beyond just an impulse purchase, that it will be something that's on brand, makes more value for their users and is actually more usable for them. Different example I want to give you um, has to do with um, NRMA. Um, they found that they had this circumstance where at the point of their customer's journey, where customers were ready to renew their comprehensive insurance, many of them because of COVID were opting out. And, and I'm sure we can empathize with this. I'm worried if I'm going to keep my job. Uh, I'm not driving my car anyway. Why, why do I need um, comprehensive insurance? So as a response to that, what NRMA wanted to do was nudge them to change. And they stood up a very interesting opportunity, which was a $10 month, opt out any time, $10 a month, third party fire and theft. What's remarkable is though, is that in doing that, they discovered a whole untapped segment of the market who had wanted that product offering from insurance all along and it was just never offered to them before. So their new leads for this grew by 500%. And I think the kind of, um, some of us are finding sometimes that our CX improvements are hard fought to create um, the kind of bottom line impact that we want. It's a bit frustrating when someone else in a different vertical almost finds one by luck, right? And as a result of that, manages to get some, some response from that. My favorite example from this though is T-Mobile. And I'm sure for this group, you've heard of this client, this group before. Um, in 2012, 33 million US clients, in 2017, 72 million clients doubling in a, in a five-year period. They accredit all of that to their uncarrier moves, which is all about improving customer experience. 
I just want to talk to a couple of these. Sure, they did a lot of stuff like abandoning roaming charges and, you know, changing upgrades and doing a bunch of things to make it simpler for customers. And they were appealing to all of their, um, their customers' lizards when they did that. But two really important things I think were kind of compelling to me. The first one was how they realised that with using personalised mobile video, video content, that they could increase their inquiry by 300% and their conversion by 500% simply by managing that interaction at that stage and changing what their customers were experiencing. So part of this growth wasn't just about making things simpler. It was about leveraging the data about what changed. I'll give you a second example that I think is important. They went from 400 odd different rate plans down to just one. Now you can say, well, simple is better and that's great. But understand why they had the 400 rate plans in the first place. Their business model is largely full of fixed costs. And can you imagine the data and courage that it would have taken to go, instead of extracting the maximum profit out of customers by having this huge range of plans, what we can do is value the trade-off between the number of customers we will onboard and keep because it's simple versus the number that we would get at a high margin if we do this in a more difficult way. And I think you can only do that if you're managing your customer journey rather than just mapping it. So. I want, to, I want to advocate to you a really important take home message. It's really simple. You can find moments in your customer's journey where everything can change, but you can't do that unless you're managing the journey. So we wrote a couple of books about customer experience and customer strategy. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you'd like to consider the conversation. And I'm very keen to talk to you about your questions and what's going to happen in the future. But I do want you to be open to this possibility that it's customer management that matters more than customer mapping in terms of your journeys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was fascinating. Um, just before we jump to the second speaker, I'm going to run a quick poll, which hopefully you can see now. And we are keen to understand where you're at um, in your customer journey management journey. So we're asking, how would you rate the maturity of your organization's customer journey management? And uh, there are four options there. would really appreciate everyone making a vote. You can see quite a few responses coming through. We'll end the poll in uh, a few seconds and then share it. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll now and share those results with you. Uh, so I hope everyone can see that on the screen. Um, so uh, I guess more than half of the respondents uh, amongst you said that you do journey mapping well, but would like to evolve more to a journey management approach. Um, which is a great segue um, for our next speaker. Uh, so we're going to go straight to the second presentation. I'd like to introduce Michael Renzon, who's co-founder and CEO of Incuba. Michael's going to share insights on the reality of dynamic customer journeys, why value delivery is often misunderstood, and how to influence and change customer behavior. So that's a lot there. Take it away, Michael. Great. Um, thanks, Sharon. So, um, we started Incuba, it was 11 years ago. Um, and we really started from a, a clean slate, clean piece of paper. And um, one of the, the first things that we did in the company is we, we literally drew on, on paper how this would, would look. And we, we took a 10-year um, a view. And what we saw is really kind of coming together 10 years later. But at that point in time, it looked so complex um, around being able to access the amount of data that was needed for uh, for journey management that a lot of what we did in the in the early days we, we used that framework to uh, deploy what would be, be seen as a classical cx solution but we, we really have seen the the evolution over the course of the the last 10 years and um the reason this is so important and uh, just touching on uh, on, on Robert's um, analogy of murmurating birds is that um, when when birds murmurate, the, the process is, is dynamic and there's a, a, a guy named Wayne Potts, he's a zoologist and I did a bit of research on this, 
what he, he did to, to understand the memoration, he used video cameras and he, he, he took a look at the data points around how the birds were moving. And he actually established causality. The reasons that the birds memorate in a particular way is uh, that they're looking for food sources. And birds that they typically memorate um, is in, in this particular idea is that if we have the data, we are able to, like memorating birds, we're able to see the dynamic nature of, of customers moving through, through these journeys. So um, when I talk about this, the, the essence of the technique, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, is by digitizing the breadcrumb. So most people are familiar with um, how um, a Google cookie would work. But if you scale this up and you do it in a multi-channel way, um, and you're collecting this data about customers as they move through uh, digital environments um, and you are able to collect it and you're able to sequence it, you come out with, with, with this, this view and the view is the, the, the essence and the starting point of, of journey management. So why is it so important? The, the reason it's so important is that um, we, customer journeys are, are dynamic. So when we launch a project within the first week, we can start seeing the flow of these journeys. So what I have on the screen here is really the way that an orchestration would look. Um, the, these journeys get digitally map, mapped out, but it's not a digital mapping sequence where uh, an author would go and plot this. This is actually re rendered digitally. And the way that it uh, typically works uh, in journey management is that the thickness of the line um, shows how many customers traversed a particular journey path. Um, and um, if there's a, a sequence or change in sequence, for example, this could be an, an online journey path. This one over here could be this group of customers carried on in the journey online and this group of customers came off the digital journey. They carried on, but they switched uh, to an alternate channel, for example, a, a call center channel. So when we sequence the data, it really is the starting point, um, and, and we digitize the data, it really is the starting point of being able to understand and make this move from journey uh, mapping to journey management. And it allows us to answer a range of questions that you can't use with, with conventional techniques. And these questions are particularly powerful questions so what I'm going to do is actually talk through these particular questions and, and just share the, the answers and, and move through them quite quickly and then move through to applications. So first thing that we want to see is where, where are people going and did they, they actually get there? So Incubus developed a five-step methodology. The first step is to discover real journeys. And the way that we do that is once we digitize the, the data, um, and that process, when we say digitizing the data, we always start off with the journey map, and then we, we take a look at where does the data come, come from. And then what the tech does is it, con, uh, is, uh, it looks, we, we work with the customer to see where those data sources are, and there are a range of techniques that we bring that data into the solution, typically in real time, but it can be hourly, it can even be intra-daily to be able to build up these particular sequences. Once we've done that, we want to establish a goal. So if you think of the bird example, the, the goal could be we'll find a, a food source. So um, a goal is usually a success point. So in telco, it could be that the customers acquired a product. Um, in utilities, it could be some kind of uh, it could be some kind of retention, a particular particular point, and that would be the goal point. And then we divide that goal point into a number of points that we want people to get to along the way to get to that particular goal point. We also set up the idea of a, a drop-off point. So that establishes the, the, the base framework. Um, we then want to do an analysis, and this speaks to Robert's presentation. We've seen the one thing we see more than anything when we digitize this data is that um, people do not behave, customers do not behave, even with extensive journey mapping in the way that we, we anticipate. And, um, I was on a Zoom last week with one of the, uh, with, with, with a major bank, and um, we, 
we, we were in discussion with, with the head of product and she said, um, this is exactly what I've been talking about. Everyone agonizes over the journey map. Is this right? Is this right? And then when we switch on, uh, we, we take these new products live, people don't behave the way that, that we anticipate. And she was totally in sync about this idea of rapid testing. Don't agonize over the journey map get it down and then actually see what people do and then adjust dynamically. So the way that we, we do this is where we find a journey path, we take a look at the data of that particular journey path. And there's a lot of data, some of the data or, or a lot of it is metadata that we bring in with that particular journey point. And that could be things like statement data. So for example, it could be young people who are using a digital channel, but what we find with certain journey points is that we can find the segment, but we don't know what the causality is of the, the behavior. So what we do is we ask them, we ask them dynamically on the journey. So we can take this particular journey line and we, we, we tap on it, click, and we click there. And we say, well, with this group of people, uh, they, they switch channels, they went to the call center, they can actually finish the journey. And the, the tech would only ask that particular group of people and it would ask them dynamically as they switched, well, why did you switch channels? And we would get an answer and get that answer very quickly. So it's different to CX uh, where you set up a program and you run it for a, a year or two or three with, with, with moderate changes. This is a highly dynamic environment. So we developed something called a value model which is kind of like a, a, a pop-up mega survey that takes very little effort. It's, it uses unstructured text analytics. And then we divide those reasons into four core categories, which would be people are doing the things that they're doing because of economic value, functional value, that there's a, a product like Robert's example, well, why didn't you video anyone? Well, uh, there was no video, that would be a good example. Could be symbolic, it's brand related, and it could be experiential, which is the domain of CX people. So once we've done that, the next thing that we want to do is um, we want to find out from, from that group of people why they're dropping off and what's important to them. So we overlay the VOC data against the, the, the journey data and we get to drop off analysis, and that's super powerful. And um, we can then click on a particular goal, a drop off point, an in progress particular point. And um, we can start seeing a lot of detail like drop off channel, drop off duration. Um, we can see drop off segment and then the value model, which is the, the, the drop off reason. And then the last thing that we want to do is well, the second last thing is we want to go into the world of nudging. Um, and um, we, we were actually having a discussion with, with one of the, the global CX players. And this was like, they, they couldn't get past this, this point of view that um, CX people or as a CX company, they didn't want to go into the orchestration market. And I said something to them that like really uh, the, the light turned on. What I shared with them is that CX practitioners always talk about um, from insight to action. So, the, the question I then ask, but what happens if that insight is in real time and the only um, benefit of that action is if the action is offered in real time as well? So you've got a certain time period that if you don't offer that particular action, uh, let's say it's explaining a misconception about a product, you're going to lose that customer. So a real time action is an orchestration. So the blurring of the lines between uh, CX people focusing on insights and um, this idea of actioning being another department, we can see already is, is going to fade away as we, we, we move more and more to, to a real-time type of world. So these inter intervention strategies are typically triggered in real-time and they're dynamic. They dynamically would change in real-time based on the journey path and the kind of question that we, we, we've asked of, of someone. And then we would trigger up an in-based uh, action or could be an AI-driven uh, type, type of action. The last step that we want is the idea of where the strategy is effective. And that's the capability to be able to review and to be able to optimize. And we, we use testing con uh, control groups and uh, ABN testing 
extensively to be able to uh, get a sense of the, the accuracy of the experiments that, that we're running. So that's really the, the framework and the methodology supported by, by the Influber Journey Cloud to be able to uh, to be able to, to implement this. So we we'll spend um, um, about three minutes each on, on two case studies and work through them. The, the first one is this idea of a brand infused journey. And we have implemented this in several places. This particular use case is about an investment customer, but of course, equally well to utilities and uh, to some extent into, into telco. And the basic idea is rather than ask people how they're feeling, create um, the emotions and how you want them to, to feel. And the reason this is so important is we've seen over the past two years with COVID and lockdown and economic pressure that people are switching um, more so than, than ever. And we want to be able to, to manage uh, this process and how people feel proactively rather than, than reactively. So Forrest has got a really um, a, a good framework around this brand infused journey, but what you're trying to do is create a space and you want to get fluidity in, in, in that particular space in, in, in moving people through a story, an emotion, uh, a narrative, uh, having an emotional memory. And we said, well, if there's this idea, how can we take this idea and implement it? So we started with the journey map for this particular customer and we said, well, here's your journey map, here's your journey design and we did the use, usual things. How do you want your customer to feel? And uh, what do you want your, in this case, it's a member to do? And the, the feeling and the doing are closely interlinked because if you want your customer to be knowledgeable and you want them to understand their products, they're gonna to have to do things to get them there, you're going to have to explain it, and you're going to have to make sure that they go through those motions. And we took a look at the toolkit that they have. A core one was the portal. If you go into the portal and you start using the calculators and you understand how your investment, or in this case, it's a superannuation product, how it works, you get a sense of control. You understand it against the landscape and competitive products in the market, and you're able to gain that knowledge, which was the first step in. in particular journey. So this is how, um, when, when we digitize it, this is how it starts looking, which is quite fascinating. And th this is just the onboarding journey. And you can see what happens just with the simple welcome message, all the paths that people take. This group over here did nothing. This group over here uh, responded to the nudge, or, or they looked at it, and they did something, and they went idle. We switch channel here for this group, uh, anyone who clicked on a link, they went into a, a WhatsApp dialogue, which is also driven by the internet platform around the orchestration, or it could be a third party platform. And then we ask them a question, have you considered, uh, tell us about your retirement goal. And some of them said they haven't considered it. Uh, others said that uh, they wanted to maintain it. Others would said they wanted to retire early. And a fourth group said that they wanted to um, be able to retire and help not just themselves, but their family. What we saw is based on their response, their willingness to engage further and actually go to the portal, portal login and a time goal, um, very greatly. People who haven't re, uh, considered their time goals were not particularly proactive. We saw a whole group of other people that when we said to them, well, why didn't you respond to the message? We, we did it politely. Um, th that group simply said, well, uh, they, they hadn't heard about the portal, even though they had been messaged about the portal. So you see, P customers don't always uh, hear or respond to the things that, 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 that we tell them. Using this particular framework, um, we saw some very powerful results. 40 to 6 of, 6 of the members who responded to a nudge went on to, to, to register on, 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 on the portal. Um, if, if we take a look at um, some of the other things that we saw is that the, 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 cloud the cloud platform allowed us to engage and to find out from people why they were not doing the things that, that we, we, we thought they were doing. And that gave us clues as to the right kind, kind of nudging. We also saw that the goal of getting people to the portal, and this is something that we didn't know, we always thought they'd be drop off from the login to the end goal, but we saw people move through that seamlessly. So 
using these techniques um, within a period of literally a couple of weeks, we, we did a couple of weeks of analysis. We then came out with a new engagement strategy and we were able to move the level of engagement from 16 to 6% 6 to 16%. And we know that another week we'll get it to 20 to 20, 25%. So the results are, are high impact and they work really, really quickly. So we can see it works, um, provides clear insight as to drop off. We see customers behave in unanticipated ways, shows that tweaks and nudges have a high impact. And it gives very deliberate things around what we're going to be doing as a next step. We came up with the idea of landing pages for, for very specific reasons. And once the basic framework is set up, it's quite easy to move from onboarding to, to other parts of, of the journey. So the second use case is really, it's, uh, it's a telecommunications use case, it's one of our telco customers. And um, this is the whole idea of, of drilling. So many people, um, um, in, in the match board session today are from, uh, from Telco and others from utilities. And um, we often see when we look at the CX data that it's quite general. And this is frustrating for, for the Telco or for the utility operator because um, with general feedback, you can't really turn it into, into action. So what we did is we started a process of design thinking to say, well, instead of just looking at this data like uh, I'm not happy with my turnaround time, what would the ideal service experience look like with Intel in particular? And the things that we realized is that um, a customer really wants you to proactively fix their problem even before you, you know about it. And if they can't, they want to be notified. And then if it is something that they pick up, they want a very fluid journey where uh, their expectation is, is managed. So we, we use this particular idea and we came up with two themes. The first theme is manage my expectation. And the second theme is proactively, uh, proactively engage with me um, where you find something and you know about it. Um, don't just wait until my line or my fiber or something's not working. And based on that, we use quite a different approach. And you can see a, a very blended kind of approach, even though Incuba would define ourselves as a CX company, we've moved right into the world of, of orchestration because we've seen that in a real world, you can't really un unpull these things apart. And we designed a set of orchestrations to say, well, how would we change the service journey? And the first one is we want to manage the, um, the expectation. And so from the actual Incuba platform, we, we, we start the orchestration. So for example, Harlan, we, we're aware that your ticket has been closed. Please let us know if your issue has been resolved. And we, we send this directly from our platform. So this is an example of point number four in managing this SLA. And as we move through the SLA, we, if the person says, well, well, no, usually you just say yes and you, you get a survey response, but let's say they say no. What we then do is we say, we're sorry, your ticket hasn't been adequately resolved. Please tell us the reason why, um, why you feel it hasn't been resolved. And then we take action directly from the platform. We send it to a, a trio center which is a level up from your first level support with specialist people who would then resolve it. So it's a very different approach to bending CX and, and, and orchestration. And when this approach is, is, is used, the analytics come out really differently. Um, what we can see is the analytics playing out in, in real time. And this is just the thematic of the unstructured text analytics. We can see the things that people are complaining about, the real problems that they're complaining about because we capture the data at that point of the orchestration. So for example, experiential, if we click on that, it shows a map of the things within experiential of why those particular, uh, uh, why someone had a negative experience, uh, but it's driven from the real-time interaction rather than as, as, as an afterthought. So um, that is really the, uh, the, the context behind it and, and two examples. Um, a big question that we get is, well, 
we, we really like these ideas and, and we, we want to mobilize our organization, but it's, 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 it's difficult. So we designed a range of, of, of tools to be able to, to do that. Um, and one of them that's incredibly powerful is an idea of what we call Journey Accelerator. And what we do is we work with a group of people to unravel the problem and to go into basic things. So what does the solution design look like at a high level? Uh, does the organization have enough data um, to be able to execute on that solution design? What would the ROI look like? Because business people uh, always want to see the ROI before moving forward with, with this particular piece of, piece of work. Um, and that delivers all the things for those internal discussions to answer those questions uh, before getting to a more detailed type of proposal. So one of the things that we are offering um, to the attendees uh, of this match board event is we usually charge two and a half thousand dollars for that particular process. And uh, if anyone um, in the session is interested, we will do that as a complimentary uh, service for your organization. So um, that brings me to the end of my presentation and I'm going to pass the floor back to, to Sharon for Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. And that's a great offer, the Journey Accelerator Workshop. Um, I will include that email address that Michael showed on the screen when I sent around the survey after the event so that you can action that offer if you wish. Um, but now it's time for the fun part, audience Q&A. So I really encourage you to uh, start a discussion uh, or join a discussion. Um, either you can pop a question in the chat room um, or you can actually unmute yourself, have your camera on and uh, talk to your question directly. And just a reminder, um, we will be awarding a prize of the um, uh, new book, Lean CX, to the most interesting question as judged by uh, the Incuba team. Um, and I can see that we actually got a question already through in the chat room and, and please everyone else feel free to, um, to put yours in. So Esther is asking, I noticed that you poll the customer right after the welcome message on their experience, as opposed to at the end of the journey after registering in the portal. What points in the customer journey do you think it best to poll or survey customers and ask for their feedback on the experience? Michael, uh, could you answer that one? Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, that really is a uh, transition um, from thinking from typical uh, a CX perspective um, to, to, journey, to journey thinking. Um, in, in journey, you typically want to be able to get feedback as quickly as possible because um, what we're doing, and um, I'll, I'll share an, an example that comes out of uh, onboarding. This is uh, this is from our banking customers, but it's uh, it's as applicable for onboarding for utility or, or for telco. So, what we what we've done in the banking one is a, a very visual type of example. So, um, where we see a drop off, uh, and, and this is typically in a, a digital type of banking environment. Uh, someone says, well, they want to quote for, for uh, a credit card and they've gone through the whole um, kind of application uh, process and then they, they, they drop off at that particular point. And the way that we measure drop off is if it's something real time and they're meant to click to get to the end of that process and they don't, then that's a drop off. Or well, if there's a time lapse and uh, they don't complete that, we would keep that, uh, we would store that as a delay. We actually generate something that looks like a, a, a delay or um, the, the, the customer's not, uh, not, not doing anything, they're dormant at that point, and then we would serve it up. What we've seen is if we question at that point, so for example, we say, well, um, you applied for a credit card, we sent you a quote, you didn't take it up, please tell us a reason why. Um, we we find customers are highly responsive and in the banking scenarios, 
the average that we got was a 29% response rate, whereas in surveying, um, when you ask that same question, it would probably be, be anywhere between 5% on the low side, and maybe 14 or 15% on the, the high side. So uh, the first thing is changing your, your, your polling into something that's real time, start sounding a lot more like a conversation. And when there's a conversation or digital conversation, people are far more engaged. The other thing and benefit that we get out of it is that they say immediately what, um, what their reason is. And some customers said they didn't understand the product really, or their answer showed that they didn't understand it. Others said interest rates were too high or uh, the, the bank fees were too high. And then what we did is we, we took those reasons and we actually developed the orchestrations together with the marketing team. And we serve up those, those orchestrations in real time. So for example, a customer who says, well, interest rates are too high, what, we, uh, what, what, what the platform and the tech and the methodology would do is it immediately serves up um, a campaign. It doesn't look like a campaign. It actually says, well, our, our uh, interest rates are the lowest in the market um, if you compare it in this way. And what we were able to see is when you use nudges in that way, in the banking example, um, the drop off rates in banking uh, for, for um, acquisition. Now imagine um, um, in telco onboarding, it's, it's, it's probably, it's probably quite, quite similar, is we were able to get a 100% increase in conversion at multiple points. So the first thing is that we get a much deeper insight. We get it, it's particular to a group of people. We are able to do something with that particular insight and we're able to, to, to get an impact uh, around it and isolate that group of people. So um, I really believe that this will be a shift in the, the CX domain and, and landscape to asking people as close to the event is something happen, happening or why they didn't do that particular thing. I think for an NPS type of question, it would make sense to move it further down. You want to get an overall experience, but I think particularly as the world moves more and more digital, uh, companies really want to see what causality is and they want to be able to impact that and they want to increase conversion. Thanks, Mike. We've got some really great questions that have also come through on the chat. Um, just the last one was from Mark Kessler. What key metrics or analytics do you use to measure the effectiveness of a customer journey other than using customer feedback intercepts and the actual goal completion like commercial outcomes or sales? Um, customer effort score, for example. Would that be yeah. a key metric that you would recommend on a customer journey uh, management so, approach? Um, what we've done is we use many of the, the CX metrics that you would anticipate. So um, we, we often um, include NPS at the end of the journey or at a particular journey point where it makes sense. Person would have had to go far enough in the journey, they drop off immediately, you don't want to ask them the NPS question. Um, so what we would typically do is at the end of that, that journey um, experience. So let's say uh, onboarding, um, we would ask the, an NPS question. NPS, customer satisfaction, we have done customer efforts before, um, before as well. Um, and something that's really interesting from, from the data that we, we're picking out is that there, there is this, um, um, it is this, this myth that has developed uh, within customer experience practitioners that if you increase your NPS uh, by a whole lot, you will get a very different, uh, different outcome. But what we've seen particularly around journeys, it's quite fascinating. You can get a 100% increase in conversion at multiple points in that journey and um, your NPS score of the two different groups, when we do the test group and the control group, will be identical or almost identical in one um, test that we did, it was identical and we had exponential increase in conversion of the group that went through the managed journey. The only difference was a slight change in customer sentiment. So um, the group that was helped through um, um, felt um, uh, the, the experience is slightly more positive, but not measured as by an NPS score, but measured by, by sentiment. And 
What that shows us is that um, in many ways, the experience is really a hygiene element. It has to be good enough, the, the experience, but if it's at a good enough level, you're not going to get a whole lot more conversion by making it better. Um, and we, we're finding some really fascinating insights by working with the data and overlaying NPS um, and customer set and effort over the, the journey because we're seeing that the problem may not be an experience problem. It could be a marketing or communications problem that people don't understand that particular product. Okay, great. Um, now, Brett from AGL has asked another one. How do you pick up drop-off online and in the contact center for prospects or non-registered users? In other words, um, identify omni-channel journeys. Okay. Um, so the way that we do it is we use the same mechanism that um, marketers use. We, we track cookies and um, we, we track those cookies the whole way, the whole way through, um, irrespective of where, uh, where that person has come from. And we keep tracking that particular cookie for journey management and journey analytics at a point in time, you have to be able to identify the customer. So every point in that journey is made up of three data points. There is the time that that thing happened. It's the actual event when, when that particular thing happened. And the third data point is who that thing happened to. So we kind of lie in waiting. It sounds a bit sinister, but um, that's the way that the internet works. And we, we track it and then as soon as the customer has put in anything that would identify them, so they would have had to start some kind of process, we can then track it back. And when we track it back, we then draw out the journey map that we do that um, uh, post actively, uh, as soon as we get that customer identifier. If you don't have an identifier, you can't generate journey, uh, journey uh, journey analytics or journey discovery, you have to have a customer identifier at a point in time, but you don't have to have it immediately. Okay, great. Now we have a question from NBN. Mike is asking when we're dealing with large ecosystems, especially within te the telco space with wholesalers, retailers, delivery patterns and the like, the customer experience is the sum of everyone's experience and the effort it takes throughout. How do you start to add that into the picture to show the CX is tightly linked to the EX. That's well, a tough question. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if Rob, you had any thoughts? Yeah, we, um, we've actually just started to get serious about thinking about what we're calling uh, workforce experience. So we call it WEX. And it's the idea that often some parts of your experience hang on someone that's not even in your organization. So I want to give you um, a, a small example of that. How many of us have ever got a home delivery very, very happy about the purchase that we've made only to have a really poor delivery experience and therefore for our whole experience to be um, let down. Uh, my experience of this, I know they're not on the call today, so I'm going to out them because they deserve it, was um, came from dealing with Nespresso and, and Toll. So Nespresso offered me typically two delivery options and I'm a coffee fiend. I, I don't know about the rest of you. I spend about $8,000 a year on Nespresso coffee pods. Okay, so that's like, um, in my household. So I feel like I should be treated like some kind of valued um, customer for massively overpaying that much for coffee that, in that level of volume. Um, what happened is on their website, when I reorder, I'm given an option. I can get Australia Post two to three days or I can get toll next day delivery, um, but both free. Right. And so I picked the toll one because it's faster. Right. That, if there's no cost difference, I want my coffee, get it here faster because this is an emergency. Right. If we run out of coffee, this is a pretty serious negative thing. Turns out that half the time toll never deliver to me. They deliver to a news agent that's a suburb, one, one suburb away, and then kind of claim that they've made this delivery. Now, I can't deal with toll directly to fix that and I don't want to have to. And so when I deal with Nespresso to fix that, of course, they don't get the idea that a whole part of their experience is hanging on toll. Um, one of the things that I've noticed um, since then is that now toll are no longer as offered as a delivery option. And I think they're, they're putting in place the right service level agreements for your distributed workforce is a really big deal. 
Of course, if you talk to toll themselves, their problem is, is that that person who's turning up to my place is a subcontractor. It's not even an employee of theirs. And, um, and that subcontractor's plan is to pretend that I wasn't home so that it's faster to make a delivery and dump them all off at the, um, uh, at the news agent because the price that they're being paid to provide the service is an issue. And so there's an aspect of service delivery design that you need to get right when you're dealing with your, um, your distributed group to make sure that things work. And there's a problem here because we uh, get fresh beans from my coffee shop. Who's saying that, Brett Cooper? <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I probably need to do that. If it's any consolation, I no longer purchase from Nespresso anymore. They upset me so much, I don't deal with them. But um, one of the things that's interesting is, is that you have to write service level agreements that are a little bit more human. And people who want to write contracts are very uncomfortable about that. Right? Think about uh, dealing with your IT department. You say, I want the platform to be engaging for customers. And they say, oh, so do we need to change the colors or do we mean to put their name in it? And this required to be specifically autistic about something that makes something human is, uh, is the problem. I think where, where journey management helps you man get into this is it gives you a kind of data that the people who need specificity can handle. It helps them not have to be, the other people who are dealing with it helps them not have to be as human. Right. And so those service level agreements become really, really important. Right. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, this is the last question, which I'm going to read out because we're almost out of time. Um, so I might let Mike and Rob have a crack at this. Just very succinct answer would be great. What would you say are the top three reasons for drastic customer drop off in CX flows? Okay. Um... Our, our data is clear. Uh, the, the, the number one would be people are busy. Um, uh, you're competing with everyone else in a very noisy environment. And we, we can see that because um, when, we, when we prompt them, um, they, they respond. So we can see that typically people are busy. The second one is that Companies typically design very well thought out products and often reasonably well thought out processes, but we can see very clearly from, from the data that people don't understand them. If you're buying something that's complex, like um, uh, you're buying a service from a utility or you're buying a new telco package, um, the people who work for the telco or the utility who design these products, it's what they do every day. But we see it so clear from, from the data that customers don't get it there. So it's this whole idea of, of in-journey communication rather than um, kind of um, uh, kind of pushing pushing through. And then I think the, the third reason wouldn't be a single reason. Um, we, we seeing, and, and this is fascinating, is that the belief that people drop off and they'll do it for a single reason. We see in the data is it's a human thing to believe that, but it's an irrational belief. Um, at any particular drop off point, we see there's a whole lot of different segments. And if we analyze the segments, we see uh, behind them are very different people. And those people are behaving in very different ways. And um, if you want to make an impact, you've got to start with the largest ones and move through to smaller groups if it's worthwhile to be able to address those particular problems and that could definitely be the third one. I, I'm, I'm going to try and be um, a little bit easier. We talked about, cap, I talked about capital needs before. So one of the reasons that people drop off is that those capital needs exist in pairs. There's a pair for your lizard, there's a pair for your Labrador, and then there's a pair for your leader that matter. If your product or service is designed to pick the wrong pair, uh, the wrong side of that pair, people will drop off when they realize that. So, um, for example, if I'm interested in what you're doing because it's new and what you're busy trying to do is create certainty and simplicity for me, then I'm going to drop off at that point. If I'm trying to make a connection to be part of a group and what you're actually doing is presenting me with prestige, which is excluding me from the group, I will drop off at that point. So it really has to do with the jobs to be done. You've got to understand and I'm with Mike on this. I think the segment of customer that you're targeting is important. And there's a kind of a one, it's not a one size fits all and it's not a one size fits none. It's a one size fits a few. So how do you provide a variable experience that meets people where they're at and meets their needs? And I think if you do that, then you'll retain them. Back to okay, you. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up, but before we do, 
Mike, who was the winner of the best audience question? Um, that is Mark Kessler. Okay, fantastic, Mark. Uh, I'll be in touch to arrange delivery yeah. of your book. And uh, that brings our event to a close. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will be sending around a short survey. Would really appreciate one minute of your time there. Um, the Incuba team remain available to engage further and do take advantage of their special offer, um, which um, I'll share the email address for. Uh, wishing everyone a wonderful day ahead. Stay safe and well. See you next time. Thanks very much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Great session. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks.